Indeed, I, I want to talk about the coolness of graphs, but before I start talking about the graphs themselves, I, I would like to tell you how this presentation came to be. So a, a couple of years ago, I was studying artificial intelligence and there I, I saw graphs in, in all the different subjects that I that I got. So um, and and they appeared to to come back again and again in very different forms. So uh, all sorts of different techniques and and, uh, and uh, algorithms used artificial uh, in artificial intelligence use these graphs. And I thought, how how can it be that they're so ubiquitous? Is there something about graphs that that's just so reusable that they can be used anywhere? Um, and, and it inspired me to think about this uh, idea of a personal assistant that could do anything. So, for example, if you want to uh, arrange your birthday, that it can um, look at your agenda and uh, look at the agenda of your friends and look at the place where you where you're, uh, all the potential places where you can hold your birthday and then uh, work out the, the optimal way to, to hold your birthday and you can build very uh, independent systems that can all do that. But to make a single system that, that can do all of that, I think you need some representation that can represent both agendas and uh, meeting locations and uh, availability and, and all the different aspects that go into planning things like this. And I think the only way to uh, make sure you can represent all of that differently is, is through graphs. So that inspired me to, to look deeper into graphs. And there's actually one um, one more thing that that I don't tell people a lot, and I I've always wanted to uh, build this video game. And in all video games, when you talk to people, you get a list of, of things you can say. And I wanted to build a game where you can ask anything to anyone. And because the game was built uh, as a graph, um, if you ask a question, it's just a query on that graph, and you can ask anything to anyone and and that has been uh, a, a dream for me for some time and that also made me really research graphs and it made me really enthusiastic about graphs and and what i think is graphs can do anything um, and that's what i wanted to share with you today so uh, let's get through the dry part first so um, before we can talk about graphs what is a graph so uh, mathematicians uh, define a graph um, using formulas, but I'll draw, draw an example for you here. So a graph uh, consists of two things, namely uh, nodes. So those are uh, the entities and the relations between them called edges. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. So, um, but the thing is, uh, oh yeah, here, so here's the representation. Uh, so you have a set of the nodes and then a set of the, the different uh, edges in the graph and what you can see uh, I put accolades around the uh, edges because they, the order doesn't matter so whether you write v3 v1 or the other way around doesn't really matter in this case but you can do anything with graphs so you, you can also define them very differently so uh, what if you do uh, impose an order on your graph then suddenly it becomes a directed graph so um, now it depends uh, the, the order uh, changes the, the meaning of the graph, uh, of the edge in the graph. Um, and, and now you can represent very different things like one way streets or a relationship that is a mutual. Like if I punch you in the face, that doesn't mean you punch me in the face, right? Um, but why would you restrict yourself to just one edge uh, between nodes? So when Euler invented graph theory, um, he actually was solving a problem. How can you um, know if you can traverse from islands represented by nodes over bridges represented by edges, um, crossing every bridge exactly once? Um, and if there are multiple bridges between an island, you can represent it by having multiple edges. Um, but since you can do anything with graphs, you can also represent it in a completely different way, namely adding uh, an extra um, attribute to your uh, edges saying how many times uh, how many bridges there are in this case but, uh, again you can do anything with graphs so why limit yourself to just integers when you can uh, 
have on your attribute graph uh, something completely different, like, I don't know, another graph. Why not? It's possible. So um, here, here you can see again that uh, the representation of a graph. Um, but, you know, maybe this is a little bit silly. Maybe this is not useful at all. Um, but you can then do anything you want. So, it, so it's fine, even if it's not useful. Um, but things get even uh, stranger. So you can have uh, edges that do not connect two nodes, but uh, three nodes uh, in this example, or an infinite amount of nodes. It doesn't matter. Now, this is called a hypergraph, and it's not the same as a graph. Um, but the fact you can do anything with graphs, so you can also represent a hypergraph with a graph. You just replace the edges with uh, nodes and then connect the, uh, the original nodes to these nodes if, if they uh, were in part of that hyper edge. And now you have represent your hypergraph as a graph. So uh, yeah, graphs are pretty powerful in, in their expression. A um, few more uh, dry things. Um, so we have degree. Uh, a degree of a node means how many edges uh, connect to it. Uh, if you have directed edges, you have an in degree and an out degree. So how many edges enter into your node and exit from your node? And this is the same as having parents and children. Um, a path mean, between two nodes means that there is a set of edges so that if you traverse those edges, you get from one node to another node. And a connected graph means that um, you can get from one node to every other node in the graph. So in, in the case of the islands uh, of Euler's problem, it, your graph needs to be connected because otherwise you can never get from a set of islands that are connected here to a set of islands that are connected here that have no connection between them, right? Last but not least, um, a vector. It's not related to graphs uh, per se, but it's something that's useful to know. So a vector is just a, a list of numbers and you can add two vectors and then you just add the, those two lists. They need to be the same length. You can multiply them element wise, uh, those kinds of things. So um, I think a graph is as much constraint as, as the possibilities. It has. Um, and um, as well as the constraints that a graph has. So if you limit your graph, it becomes um, uh, that, that says a lot about what kind of problem it's, it's trying to solve. So here are a few examples. Say we have a directed graph and every node has exactly one child. Uh, and every node has exactly one parent. Well, if you continue like this, it is a circular linked list because the, the, there's there's no node that begins or ends. So okay, I was I was being a bit facetious. So if you cut the the link between v1 and v5, you have a regular linked list. You just need to change the constraints a little bit. Um, okay, another one. A directed graph, one node has no parents, so this time we're, we're not falling for that trick. And all nodes have exactly one parent, uh, but they can have any number of children. In this case, you have a tree. And a tree is, is, uh, is a very useful uh, way of representing some things, like an evolutionary tree. Because a, uh, an animal that's part of a species um, is not part of another species. So that, that's some const a constraint that you, that you can have here that is very useful to, to know that you can traverse a tree in a certain way and never end up at the, the, the same uh, node again. Um, and that allows you to do things like breadth first search. So you go down the tree layer by layer. And then if you find a solution at that point, you know that the depth at which you find it is the lowest possible depth because you've searched all the depths before. And in some problems, you want to find the, the, the first occurrence of something. So then you can use breadth or search because you know the constraints that are part of the tree. Um, similarly, a bag is like a tree, but uh, you can have multiple uh, nodes uh, share a, a child, um, which um, a, a family tree is an example of a DAG or uh, a planning system. So in uh, Airflow, for example, uses DAX. Um, and here again, you have to guarantee that if something has happened, it is not going to happen later on again. 
So there are no cycles, which is what the A, A stands for. And then uh, the last constraint is a, a bipartite graph. So that's a graph where you have two groups of nodes and the connections only go from one group to the other group. Um, and this can be useful if you're uh, modeling an assignment problem, for example. So you have uh, you have uh, people and your jobs, and you want to assign people to jobs, and um, you can model that using a bipartite graph and then solve it much more easily. Okay, so that was all the dry stuff. Here's an overview of all the things I could talk about. Um, um, but there's there's way too much, so I had to make a selection. So I selected a, a few of them, and I think they are sort of related in a way so that I can go through them easily. So let's get to it before we run out of time. Um, first off, a file system. It's just a tree. It's really easy. Uh, so you have the root and um, smart operating systems, uh, also call this the root. Um, and then at the leaves, you have your files and every, and all the, uh, and the leaf is a node without children. So it makes sense, right? Um, so how does Git work? Um, I don't think I know exactly how it works. I just know it's a DAG and on every node in your DAG, you have changes to your file system. In other words, every node has a file system as its attribute. Ha, so it did come in, uh, in useful after all that weird data structure of, uh, of uh, DAG uh, uh, graphs on your node. Um, yeah. Obligatory escapely reference, and then we can continue. So um, th there's so much you can, can model using graphs, and um, I think um, to show you some more examples, let's uh, put on our, our uh, tinfoil hats, grab our ones, and enter the realm of AI. So in AI, uh, the, one of the most recent uh, big news uh, things that happened was uh, beating Go. And uh, for those who don't know, Go is a game where you have a 19 by 19 board and you put stones on them and then you beat your opponent or they beat you. Um, that's all you need to know for now. So in a way, it's similar to Tic-Tac-Toe. In Tic-Tac-Toe, you have a board, it's a bit smaller, which puts stuff on it and uh, eventually one of, of the two wins. The difference, um, the thing with Tic-Tac-Toe is you can model this as a graph. So if you have these boards, um, from the first board, you can uh, generate all, all the other boards by placing a, a, a cross on it. And you can keep doing this until uh, eventually you uh, win the game or you lose the game or it's a tie. And the way an uh, AI system can solve this is by just going through all these possibilities and then saying, OK, uh, I'm at the end. I won. So this is something I want. Then you backtrack. Then it's, it was your opponent's turn. So they're obviously not going to go for the uh, possibility where you win because your opponent wants to win. So they're going through all the other possibilities to see if there is any possibility where they win. And then you go back and back and back to the start. Um, and then you know at the start, OK, if I pick this possibility, I will always win. And then you pick that possibility. And that's how you always win if you're a robot. Um, just for clarity's sake, this is not a tree because uh, it's possible to reach the same node through different paths. Um, and in some games, it's even possible to get back to an original state, so it's not even acyclical. But in the case of Ticato, it is acyclical. So, how hard is it to solve this problem? And naively, there are three to the power nine possibilities because uh, your board can be empty, have X's on it, have O's on it, and all different possibilities, but only a couple of them are legal, only 5K or so. But if you play the game uh, rotated like this, this or this, it's exactly the same. So uh, you might as well um, keep them the same so it's even smaller. And then the number of possible paths, so the possible games, uh, is 26,000-ish. But if you use dynamic programming, you reduce it a lot. Now let's do the same uh, with Go. Well, Go is a, a little bit bigger. So if you were to build a quantum computer, and uh, by the end of the day, you should be able to know how, um, and you know all the atoms in the world, you still don't have enough atoms to represent all the different board states. 
um, let alone the, all the different paths that you can take. Um, so there's one trick uh, that, that we use in AI and that's ignore stupid moves. Um, so how do you know if something is stupid? You train a neural network. And you train a neural network is something we do a lot in AI. Um, <clears throat> so um, what a neural network needs is it, it takes a board state and then outputs uh, the best move or a couple of the best moves. Um, but what it needs is feedback. So it needs to know, okay, um, a good move eventually lets me win. Uh, so how do you get this feedback? Well, you play until the end. And then if you won, then you give the feedback all the way through the network for every move that you made. This was a good, good move. And vice versa if you lose. So you just need to do this 10 to the 360 uh, times, and then you're done. Um, but that's still a little bit too much. Um, so if we only play the best move, we only have to repeat this 181 times until we're, until we're at the end of the game. But then you don't learn which move is the best one because at first you, you just pick them randomly. So sometimes you play randomly, so you explore a little bit. So if you, for example, say, okay, I think this move here is the best, but let's explore this one first. And the rest of the time you play uh, your best moves, you ignore all the, all the bad moves. Um, and that way, using graph theory and neural networks, and by the way, a neural network is also a graph, so you use graphs twice, and you are able to solve uh, Go. And now for something completely different. Uh, the queen hugged, the king hugged the queen because he loves her. These are words. You can turn this into a graph by saying, okay, every word comes up with another word, but that's not very useful. So let's uh, analyze this a little bit further using uh, natural language processing. So you can say, okay, uh, hugging is a verb and it connects the king and the queen in this way. And the is an article before king. Those kinds of things. Um, you can also uh, use uh, entity recognition, so saying, hey, he refers to the king and she to the queen. So you can make this an even more complicated graph. Um, and the because is a very hard one because it refers to two sentences. So you need to turn it into a kind of hypergraph to do this. But then once you've done this, you can actually rewrite the graph into something um, much smaller and much nicer. And this is called a knowledge base. And from a knowledge base, you can generate your uh, sentences again. And that's what I wanted to do uh, using my game. So build a knowledge base of my game and turn it into uh, natural language sentences. Um, an ontology is something you put on top of your knowledge base. So there are rules saying, okay, um, if I love you, you love me too. Um, it's not always true, but let, let's say for, for this sake, it, it does. And similarly, if you love someone, you have them from time to time, right? So then you have inference rules. And this allows you to expand your knowledge a lot more. And um, the semantic web is an idea that people have where you replace all of the internet with just these knowledge bases of information um, and then generate websites from them, similarly to how you generate text from the, um, from the graphs that you had earlier. Um, and some people tried this. They made uh, these uh, graphs by hand. Some of them had three billion uh, nodes in them or uh, edges in them actually. Uh, and some of them, uh, Freebase, the biggest one of them, was turned into the Google graph. Um, and here you can see all, all the movies that Ryan Reynolds played in or all the people that are related to him. And these are all uh, edges in, in some graphs uh, that are all combined into this one um, useful uh, representation. Um, the thing is, it, it's not enough. Um, so uh, recently a company called DivBot, they started automating this process using AI and they got 10 to the 12. Uh, so that's a bunch more uh, uh, edges in, in their uh, knowledge base. So things are, are speeding up here quite a lot using, uh, using AI again. One of the problems, uh, and I don't think I have time for this, but what, what I work uh, on for my thesis uh, is a thing similar to PageRank, but then for the semantic web. So uh, combining two knowledge bases 
into one. And for that, you need to draw edges between different knowledge base, uh, entities and knowledge bases um, using these vectors um, and, and deep learning. But you can ask me about it. I, it's a very interesting subject. I just don't think I have enough time for it. So let's get on to uh, one other problem, routing, obviously graph. But there are many more things you can do with routing. Um, so the short pass from A to B, that's the, the way Google Maps works. But how about the short pass path covering all nodes? So the, the mailman problem or um, the Chinese mailman problem, he wants to cover all the edges, which in this case is easy. You just run across all edges. But what if your structure is different so that you have to cross one edge twice? Then you need to make sure that that is the shortest edge. Uh, the maximum flow, if you have trucks going from A to B, how can you, and only uh, two trucks can go the above route and only three the, the lower route, for example, how do you uh, send an, the maximum number of trucks? Um, can you cut edges from nodes, like destroying a bridge, so that um, you can't go from one node to another node anymore? Those kinds of problems are all called optimization problems. And here's the example that I said before, so you want to assign things to other things, you can um, uh, see that as a flow problem similar to the to the, uh, the truck problem that I, that I just uh, talked about. And very much related to optimization is logic. So logic is optimization, but it's more certain. So uh, if you have this weird formula and you want to see if it's true or not, so can you actually prove that, that, these, uh, that there is some assignment in these variables? that makes this true. You uh, transform each uh, set of variables into um, a, an implication, and an implication has an arrow, which is nice, because then you just turn it into a graph. And actually here you can say, okay, so for example, if you look at the graph x5 is true, then x0 also ha uh, has to be true. And in that way you can see, okay, if you follow the path in the graph, you see x5 is 2 implies x5 is not true, then suddenly you know there's a contradiction and it can't be, can't be true. So now suddenly it's very intuitive and also really qu a quick linear time to solve this problem. All right, so we covered um, not all of these um, and even this is, is not all there is. So I'm going to go through a few more examples, just not as in depth to show you what the possibilities are. So Bayesian networks, you have a domain expert say, okay, income influences payments, but I don't know by how much. You throw a bunch of data at it and a Bayesian network can actually say, okay, given that I know this, um, this causes this, there is, um, it's a 20% uh, uh, influence, for example, and 80% comes from somewhere else. Um, the, the person who invented this called a Turing Award for this, which is like a Nobel Prize for uh, computer science using graphs. The Panama Papers, also a really great example, completely different. People um, said, okay, you have a bank account here and a Russian oligarch here and a fake company here, and they are connected through their money flows. And um, then uh, they said, ah, so now we can see that this uh, Russian person is, uh, is uh, doing fraud. Um, and at the center of it all is some guy called Rick van Brugge. What a bad guy. Um, so I looked up, is there anything in physics um, that has to do with graphs? And uh, obviously, um, um, atoms are graphs. I'm not going to even go into, there, into that. Um, how a virus is spread is also a graph. Uh, so try to cut as many uh, edges in, in your uh, social network graph to stop the spread. Um, there was a thread where people said, obviously it's ubiquitous in this and that and that, and, and, and it was everywhere. There's even a whole silence called network science. And here's a list of a dozen more things. Uh, network theory, which is a a branch of graph, uh, graph theory that separated from graph theory because they said, okay, we want to study real life graphs. Uh, an example of that is fractal graphs. Um, so you remember fractals, right? Um, one of the most important things uh, of fractals is the fact that they're self similar at, at lower scales. So if you zoom in, um, if you zoom in, 
they become uh, similar to themselves. Uh, they have the same structure and graphs in reality um, do the same thing. So imagine uh, your relationship with your colleagues and your team. Uh, the number of interactions you have, for example, with your colleagues um, behaves in a similar way as the interactions your team has with the teams around it, uh, which again um, has a similar structure to, uh, let's zoom in, do, 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 zoom out, uh, has a similar structure to, um, to your department with the other departments in the company and your company within uh, all the other companies that it works with. So you, every time you zoom in, you see the same structure and that, that's very interesting. Um, so all in all, I think um, the, the conclusion is uh, you can do anything with grass. And, and that makes it so cool to me. So um, if you can do anything, what's holding you back from, from creating this general AI or, or building this game where everything is possible? What, what is holding you back is, I think, your imagination. Um, so if you just uh, think freely, you can, you can do anything. And I think that's, uh, that inspires me to, to really think about, OK, what are all the possibilities and how can I achieve that? And, um, I would uh, like to end with that on that uh, that uh, positive note. So uh, thank you all for listening. I see there are uh, a few questions. Yeah, thank you, Herman, for clear examples. Uh, and it's appreciated in the Q&A also. People really like the examples which you have taken to help us understand better what graphs mean. Uh, let's look at the questions. So somebody, Eduardo said, there are bidirectional graphs which allow you to model you punching someone and them punching you back. Uh, he also asked a very a serious question. What do you think about using semantic web ideas, for example, ontology to describe our domain and use for product content description and relationships and what customers are looking for to improve matchmaking to our products to customers? Yes, that's definitely something I, I think I, I could have covered better. What are the possibilities for, for Bol.com? So, um, for example, the optimization problems that, that, that we've seen, um, we already use some of these techniques in the logistics department to optimize our routing and to uh, pick the best uh, items um, to, to pick up in one batch. But there are many more possibilities as we've seen. Um, indeed, similarly, we can use the idea of, of ontologies, rules for your um, for your um, knowledge base to model our, our content. So if you have rules that, that you um, or inference rules like, OK, if something is uh, a toy, then um, then uh, it can be played with or it, it, it is a physical thing, for example. Those inference rules you can then use to to check your your data. Um, and to um, expand your data so we have more of it and more data is always better in my opinion. Um, so that's definitely a good idea. I also like uh, Eduardo's other idea of modeling um, customers and products as a by bipartite by graph. And then if you buy something, that's a connection between things. And then you can indeed recommend uh, things that are that people that are similar to you also bought or products that are similar to each other. You, you can use a graph for that as well too. Um, and that's actually my bachelor's thesis, was to see, okay, okay how can you balance um, uh, recommending items based on uh, people that are similar to you and products that are similar to the products you bought. Um, and that's indeed a, uh, what they call a spectral graph uh, optimization problem. Um, so yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, ideas there that we can use in Bolt.com. And uh, maybe if you want to think about it uh, with me brainstorm, then I'm definitely open for, for that. On that line, the last question. If you were free to work on problem that can solve with graphs at bo.com, which problem would you choose to deliver most value to our customer? All right. I think um, the Panama Papers example um, it is, is one that, that we can use directly as fraud. So you can uh, model the behavior of a user, for example, as a graph, and then see if this graph is different from, from normal graphs 
or um, or you can uh, use um, multiple kinds of information together, so location data, but also usage data or um, data extracted from from text that that is somewhere to to indicate if something is uh, fraudulent. Like for example, to see if something is gen uh, as an auto-generated um, uh, name or or a description because it was secretly imported and translated from a Chinese company and then we sold on bought on those kinds of things. I think, uh, yeah, in the fraud domain, uh, besides all the other examples that I gave, there's a lot of opportunities yeah. to craft as well. Cool. Yeah. Nice, thank you. Thanks again, Herman, for a very passionate and insightful presentation and also sharing clear examples which can, which gives us better understanding. You can do anything with graphs. Thanks. <laughs>